not teach that God's creative activities extend also to the production of angelic beings? Yes, scripture often speaks of the angels. Christ himself taught their existence. Human experience of their influence leaves no doubt on the subject. And it is reasonable that God should have completed the hierarchy of created beings by producing purely spiritual creatures in addition to merely material and semi-material beings. Not all evidence depends upon sense experience. I have never seen an angel. I'm not now in a normal condition to see one, and I do not expect to do so until I reach heaven. I still, after all, belong to the material world. But I believe the word of God, who should know whether or not angels exist. While I do not believe that any being without body, form, or shape can exist. Well, in that case, of course, you are purely a materialist. Not only that, you are an atheist, for such an assertion denies the very existence of God. God is a pure spirit, and can certainly create beings of a purely spiritual nature. I have heard some Protestant clergymen admit that angels are not personal beings, but rather impersonal messages or good influences from God. That is but a concession to an unbelieving rationalism, and it is quite against the word of God. Scripture insists that they are personal beings. Christ said, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Messages and influences are not permanent and don't see. St. Peter says, God spared not the angels who sinned, 2 Peter 2, verse 4, and personal influences do not sin. Well, I'm a little confused about uh, the nature of these beings. What, what form uh, have these angels? We cannot speak of the form or shape of purely spiritual beings. God has no form or shape. Shape supposes dimensional arrangement, and dimensions suppose quantity of matter. Angels can exert spiritual force and even will the action of natural physical forces with God's permission. If, at times, they have appeared to men in bodily forms, they have but assumed appearances not proper to them, and most probably formed from the material atmospheric elements in order to manifest their presence in a way in keeping with man's lower level. So they're nothing like your uh, winged statues? No. God told the Jews to carve angels with wings spread to represent to men those swift spiritual beings to whom distance is as nothing. Exodus 25:18 uh, describes this. But God did not say that they were exact representations of angels. Well, can you explain a little more clearly what angels are? Angels are purely spiritual beings. A brick is a purely material being. Man with body and soul is partly material and partly spiritual. God has no material body and is purely spiritual. To complete the external manifestations of his perfections, he created beings of a purely spiritual nature, angels. The angels, then, are definite beings which have the qualities belonging to our souls, but not those of our bodies. Now, our souls have two chief faculties, intelligence and will, and these are possessed by angels. But since they are purely spiritual, they cannot be seen by our eyes any more than can God himself. Has everyone a good angel to defend and protect him? Yes. Christ took an ordinary little child and said, Despise not one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father, as stated in Matthew 28, verse 10. There's no reason why one child should have an angel appointed to guard it rather than any other, and no reason why an angel, once appointed, should desert its charge during life. In fact, the further a child wanders from God as it grows up, the more the need of a guardian angel's care and protection. Now, do not the lessons of earthquakes and similar disasters prove such belief in guardian angels to be humbug? No. 
Angels are not supposed to stop earthquakes. They cooperate in the work of our salvation, inspiring good thoughts and making us uneasy when temptations suggest themselves. I do not disbelieve in angels because they do not do what they are not supposed to do. A guardian angel could, were it God's will, prevent temporal calamities, but that is not ordinary and is not ordinarily to be expected. Temporal and natural events depend upon temporal and natural causes. Nor do temporal calamities really matter. It is the supernatural life of the soul that really counts. It is enough to remark that God has appointed certain supernatural means for our supernatural safety, and amongst those means are guardian angels. Well, the Catholic burial service asks God to bless the grave and send his angel to keep it. If there's an angel by every Catholic grave, then what does he do there exactly? Well, all who are Christians have to admit that God has done much for men by the ministry of angels. The body of a Christian is holy. It has been consecrated by baptism and will one day rise again glorious and immortal. The church speaks in a human way and confides the body which the relatives cannot keep to the custody of God's angels. It is a very beautiful thought, but when you speak of an angel by every grave, you evolve a difficulty from your imagination. An angel is not a creature subject to the laws of space. If you picture some winged animal sitting perpetually upon a tombstone, you are entertaining a ludicrous thought. But such a picture in no way corresponds with reality, and there is not a Christian who would not laugh at your simplicity. An angel is a spirit whose being is not commensurate with space and whose powers are of the intellectual and volitional orders. An angel could operate in London and New York at one and the same time, yet ever remaining in heaven. And when the church commits a grave to the care of an angel, she asks that the angel may intercede for the soul which inhabited the body we bury with so much sorrow and commits the body to its care also, since it will cooperate in the resurrection of that body as God's ministering spirit in due time. Well, what of the devil? Is he a supernatural being? He is not. He is a natural angelic being in a state deprived of supernatural grace. Well, I would claim that Satan is a mythical being. No, he is quite content to seem a mythical being. He has no desire to be detected in his operations and is not likely to inform you that evil suggestions are from him. Well, who is Satan? The word Satan in Hebrew means one who is adverse, and it can refer to any adversary. In that sense, Christ said on one occasion to Peter, Go behind me, Satan, thou art a scandal unto me, as stated in the book of Matthew, in chapter 26, verse 23. Satan, therefore, does not always refer to the devil, but since the devil, uh, once Lucifer, or the angel of light, is the greatest of all enemies to God and mankind, the word Satan has been applied in a special way to him. Of all adversaries, he is the adversary. Well, do you make him also a person rather than an influence? God endowed him with an imperishable personality. He is a person who influences. A person is an intellectual being who is master of his own freely chosen activities. It does not matter whether he be of a spiritual nature as God or the angels, or of a semi-spiritual nature as man. The devil has intelligence and free will. He can exert a spiritual influence suggestive of evil. Many people say that they do not believe in the devil, and that is quite in keeping with his wishes. But Christ definitely warns us against the evil influence of Satan. Well, I once heard a minister say that evil spirits are not really persons at all, but just evil thoughts. And then when Christ spoke of Satan falling like lightning from heaven, uh, he really saw a falling star, but lacked our present knowledge of astronomy. Christ, being God, knew all things. Uh, that minister lacked either knowledge of scripture or any real belief in the divinity of Christ. Would you say that the devil is responsible for all sin? 
and directly, yes, for he caused the fall of our first parents. Directly, no. Scripture tells us that the three great enemies of man's soul are the world, the flesh, and the devil. Men sin for mere worldly prosperity or induced by sensual passion. At times, however, Satan directly tempts them. But Satan can do no more than suggest evil to our will. He cannot compel our assent. Man can always refuse consent to evil by the help of God's grace. God is faithful, and who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, as stated in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Well, I'm having trouble imagining a god creating a devil. Um, can you imagine a good god creating such a being? I certainly cannot, but then God did not create the devil. Well, I should say that wants some explanation. Yes, you are correct, and I will explain. And God did not create the devil as a devil. In other words, God did not create any evil spiritual being as evil. The angels, as created by God, were good beings of a spiritual nature endowed with intelligence and free will. Goodness alone is the terminus of God's creative action. But some angels misused their freedom of will and rendered themselves evil by their opposition to the God who is goodness itself. Would you say there are many devils? Yes. St. John tells us that Satan was cast out of heaven and that his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation 12, verse 9. The devils besought Christ, said, quote, If thou cast us out, Matthew 8, verse 31. And they also said that they were legion, Mark 5, verse 9. Did not the schoolmen spend their time debating such questions as the number of angels that could sit on the point of a needle? That is a travesty of scholasticism. Scholasticism, or the philosophy of the schoolmen of the Middle Ages, can rightly be divided into four periods. It arose between the 9th and the 11th centuries, developed rapidly during the 12th century, attained perfection during the 13th century with the great St. Thomas Aquinas, and then fell into decline in the 14th and 15th centuries. In this last period, the best traditions of scholasticism were forgotten, and would-be philosophers were no longer creative thinkers, but rather fought amongst themselves for the honor of the systems they had adopted rather than for the truth. This led to a lot of hair-splitting debates, and when the Renaissance came, men judged scholasticism by the type they found prevailing, making no distinction between the later and the earlier schoolmen. And it was a superficial judgment. And superficial writers today still repeat the foolish statement that the schoolmen wasted time debating on the number of angels who could sit on the point of a needle. And that is simply a caricature. Men who really know something of history have realized that the scholastic philosophy must be judged by its uncorrupted form in the golden age of the 13th century, and not by those who in the period of decline were forsaking its true principles. So, Professor Whitehead, fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, writes in his book, Science in the Modern World, that, quote, the greatest contribution of medievalism to the formation of the scientific movement was the inexpugnable belief that every detailed occurrence can be correlated in a perfectly definite manner exemplifying general principles. Unquote. And he also adds that to the schoolmen is due faith in the very possibility of science. Now these words of Professor Whitehead are more valuable than the verdict of non-entities. It may be that modern materialists wish to live only by their senses, which they have in common with animals, and refuse to accept as facts all that is not subject to sense experience. But the schoolmen preferred reason, and felt obliged to account for facts made known by a revelation from God which reason justified. Knowing thus of the existence of purely spiritual beings called angels, they quite reasonably discussed their relation to space just as much a problem as the fact that 
One can get more and more ideas into his head without having to enlarge his head to provide space accommodation for them. The verdict that angels, like ideas, do not occupy space to the exclusion of others is a perfectly rational conclusion, which irrational people too easily dismiss with a contemptuous reference to angels sitting on the point of a needle. No schoolman was such a fool as to think that any bodily posture was proper to an angel. A childish want of thought is the chief characteristic of many modern supposedly wise men when they begin to discuss a scholastic philosophy of which they know practically nothing. Well, I would maintain that science leaves no room for an otherworldly religion. And you exemplify my contention that those who suppose a conflict between science and the Catholic religion understand neither science nor Catholicism. Science has proved the existence of matter by revealing stars thousands of light years away. The case is not made stronger by appealing to stars thousands of light years away. There is no need to go so far afield to prove the existence of matter. This earth is quite enough for your purpose, as you will find if you try to walk through a brick wall as if it were not there. Yet, what evidence has science given us of the existence of what people of all creeds refer to as the better world? Well, I must ask you to define what you mean by science. Do you intend merely experimental science? Do you intend to abandon all reliance upon pure reasoning? Will you deny all value to history? Do you deny, for example, that Christ ever lived because the fact cannot be discovered with a microscope? Or, granted that he lived, will you deny that his teachings merit credence because you cannot boil these teachings in a test tube? And even if you restrict science to experimental procedure, Will you brush aside all the findings of the Society for Psychical Research as being the result of either folly or fraud? You must really decide for yourself more precisely what you mean by science. Well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in the uh, Catholic doctrine that besides this material universe, he created angels. If you believe in God, who is an invisible and purely spiritual being, it's difficult to see why you should refuse to believe in angels. If one invisible and purely spiritual being can exist, well then, why not others? There is nothing against the possibility of their existence, and God has told us that he did create angelic beings. Well, I would say we can go only by our senses. Mm, that is not true. You yourself believe in logic and thought, yet you have never had sense experience of these things. You may see printed words as a dog could see them, but you have never seen with your bodily eyes the logic of thought. Then, too, you say that you believe in God, but you've never had sense experience of God. Okay, well, could you please tell me what an angel is? An angel is a purely spiritual creature endowed with intelligence and willpower. Yeah, well, I read a Catholic book once which solemnly and seriously told me that angels are possessed of wonderful agility. That information was quite correct, though it was not set down in the book you read any more solemnly and seriously than other matters in it. <laughs> okay, must Catholics believe that angels have the physical agility of an acrobat? By God's revelation, we have to believe that angels exist. We are not required to believe in any theological explanations about the nature and prerogatives of angels. But that does not forbid our discussing their nature and setting down what reason tells us concerning them. Now, reason compels us to believe in the physical agility of angels, but that has nothing to do with the agility of an acrobat. That agility is bodily and muscular. No one asserts such agility of angels. Bodily and muscular agility, however, do not exhaust the varieties of physical agility. There are other kinds. Wireless waves have tremendous physical agility. They are a physical force traveling with an incalculable rapidity of motion. Angels are immaterial and spiritual beings, and they are endowed with an agility proper to themselves. Perhaps you mean that angels have the same mental agility as clever priests for escaping embarrassing questions. 
Angels have a mental agility far above that possessed by any human mind. Being purely spiritual intelligences, they have immediate intuitions as opposed to human methods of discursive reasoning. Still, the reference to physical agility is concerned with their physical rather than with their intellectual rapidity. Well, what precisely does the physical agility of angels mean? It means that angels are not conditioned by time or space as are men, but that they can operate immediately in widely separated spheres of action. And since angels are created spiritual substances not possessing the omnipresence of God, they have to be where they operate, which supposes instantaneous transition from one sphere to another. One who believes in angels cannot deny all possible movement to them, and if we admit that angels can act now here and now there, we have no reason to deny that rapid transition is possible to them. Are we to suppose an eternal devil as well as an eternal God? Or did, did God create the devil? We cannot suppose an eternal uncreated devil. Yet God did not create the devil as a devil. In other words, God did not create any evil spiritual being as evil. He created all things other than himself, including angels. The angels, as created by God, were beings of a spiritual nature endowed with intelligence and free will. And as the terminus of God's creative action, they were entirely good. But some angels misused their freedom of will and rendered themselves evil by their opposition to the God who is goodness itself. Evil is opposed to good. He who is opposed to God is opposed to the good and renders himself, therefore, evil. But God is not the cause of such evil. His purpose in giving freedom of will was in order that the angels might have the great dignity of offering him not a compulsory love, but a love of free choice. And he forbade that misuse of the gift of freedom which rejects the infinite goodness of its source. God could not forbid sin, yet be the cause of it. St. Peter's words that God spared not the angels who sinned show that some angels fell from the good state in which they previously existed into a sinful state, and that they were responsible for their own evil choice, that God had that dominion over them which could belong only to their creator, and that God does punish deliberately chosen and unrepented wickedness. Well, the rebellion of angels in heaven is an enigma to me. It is a mystery which human reason cannot probe to its full depths, but in no way is there any actual conflict with reasonable principles. Okay, well, these angels had an intelligence immeasurably transcending that of human beings. Is that your contention? That is true. Where men have to secure data through their senses and reason discursively from premises to conclusions with liability to error, both as regards facts and logical process, the angels, as pure spirits, untrammeled by the weight of earthly and material bodies, could perceive truth by an immediate intuition. For this reason, their guilt was immeasurably greater than that of human beings. And therefore, God showed mercy to men, though he spared not the angels who sinned. Well, they must have known that they were created by God, and that by his very uncreated nature, God infinitely surpassed them. And that is quite true. They fell into no intellectual error on that point. Okay, but yet we're told that pride led them to attempt equality with the uncreated God? They were not so foolish, of course, as to think that they could be equal to the uncreated God. Yet pride did cause their fall. Pride is a sin of the will, not of the intelligence. But every choice of the will, even though it be an evil choice, presupposes at least an intellectual apprehension of the evil thing to be chosen. There must be a theoretical error before a practical error. But how could an angelic intelligence go wrong in its ideas? Well, we must remember that the angels were creatures and not the creator. Keener though they were than men in their powers of intuition, their intelligence was yet finite and limited. It was quite possible for them, therefore, to give less attention to one aspect of the truth and to give more attention to another. It was possible for them to concentrate their attention upon their own natural perfection 
and to fail to advert sufficiently to their origin by creation and to their essential dependence upon God. Granted this, an evil choice of the will by pride was correspondingly possible. Regarding themselves as made for themselves rather than for God, they could pretend to an independence of him, regarding him as not necessary to them, and all this without wrongly thinking that they could be absolutely equal to him and infinitely perfect. Well, isn't the devil just merely an evil influence? We cannot say that he is an evil influence. Rather, he has an evil influence both upon individuals and upon society. You know, I read recently in a book that uh, possession by devils as recorded in the Gospels was merely lunacy. And the book was written by a clergyman. It is quite true that those possessed by devils were maddened by them and exhibited signs of lunacy. But it is not true to conclude that this lunacy was due to merely natural and physical causes. If Protestant clergymen wish to deny the existence of evil spirits as personal enemies of mankind, then they will have to abandon belief in the Gospels and in Christ, if they are logical. Christ spoke of the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels, and that would be absurd if the devils were not individual, intelligent, responsible, and personal beings. The effort to find any explanation other than the actual existence of unseen spirits is useless and ridiculous. Useless in the light of such texts as St. Peter's words, God spared not the angels who sinned, and ridiculous in those who still pretend to believe in the Christian religion. The argument can only be, I do not believe in the devil because he is not seen and because he is evil. Yet, these people believe in God, despite his not being visible to bodily eyes, and they have to believe in the existence of moral evil, at least in the case of human beings. There's no reason why they should deny the existence of created spiritual beings who are morally evil, save the prevailing fashion of unbelief in the supernatural altogether. Well, I fail to see how devils can tempt men. Look at it this way. How can men tempt each other? They sow evil thoughts into the minds of their fellow men, or impress weaker individuals by the subtle influence of a strong yet evil personality. Devils can do the same. They have but to enter into the current of our own inclinations, or into the smiling appeal of seductive pleasures. They have only to lean on that which is already at breaking point, or check higher aspirations as they present themselves. The influence of devils can be like that of an undetected poison gas, breathed in imperceptibly with the atmosphere. Yeah, but why should devils tempt men? If a man is evil, he uses even his good powers for evil. We know how evil men can be apostles of evil. Now having fallen themselves, evil spirits want other creatures of God to fall and they use their powers for this evil purpose.